echoes of our dreams. In some of the most powerful and enduring myths that we have inherited from ancient times, our species seems to have retained a confused but resonant memory of a terrifying global catastrophe. Where do these myths come from? Why, though they derive from unrelated cultures, are their storylines so similar? Why are they laden with common symbolism? And why do they so often share the same stock characters and plots? If they are indeed memories, why are there no historical records of the planetary disaster they seem to refer to? Could it be that the myths themselves are historical records? Could it be that these cunning and immortal stories, composed by anonymous geniuses, were the medium used to record such information and pass it on in the time before history began. And the ark went upon the face of the waters. There was a king in ancient Sumer who sought eternal life. His name was Gilgamesh. We know of his exploits because the myths and traditions of Mesopotamia inscribed in cuneiform script upon tablets of baked clay, have survived. Many thousands of these tablets, some dating back to the beginning of the third millennium BC, have been excavated from the sands of modern Iraq. They transmit a unique picture of a vanished culture and remind us that even in those days of lofty antiquity, Human beings preserved memories of times still more remote, times from which they were separated by the interval of a great and terrible deluge. I will proclaim to the world the deeds of Gilgamesh. This was the man to whom all things were known. This was the king who knew the countries of the world. He was wise. He saw mysteries and knew secret things. He brought us a tale of the days before the flood. He went on a long journey, was weary, worn out with labor. Returning, he rested. He engraved on a stone the whole story. The story that Gilgamesh brought back had been told to him by a certain Utnapishtim, a king who had ruled thousands of years earlier, who had survived the great flood, and who had been rewarded with the gift of immortality because he had preserved the seeds of humanity and of all living things. It was long, long ago, said Utnapishtim, when the gods dwelt on earth, Anu, lord of the firmament, Enlil, the enforcer of divine decisions, Ishtar, goddess of war and sexual love, and Ea, lord of the waters, man's natural friend and protector. In those days, the world teemed, the people multiplied, the world bellowed like a wild bull, and the great god was aroused by the clamor. Enlil heard the clamor, and he said to the gods in council, The uproar of mankind is intolerable, and sleep is no longer possible by reason of the Babel. So the gods agreed to exterminate mankind. Ea, however, took pity on Utnapishtim, speaking through the reed wall of the king's house, he told him of the imminent catastrophe and instructed him to build a boat in which he and his family could survive. Tear down your house and build a boat. Abandon possessions and look for life. Despise worldly goods and save your soul. Tear down your house, I say, and build a boat with her dimensions in proportion, her width and length in harmony, Put aboard the seed of all living things into the boat. 
In the nick of time, Utnapishtim built the boat as ordered. I loaded into her all that I had, he said, loaded her with the seed of all living things. I put on board all my kith and kin, put on board cattle, wild beasts from open country, all kinds of craftsmen. The time was fulfilled. When the first light of dawn appeared, a black cloud came up from the base of the sky. It thundered within where Adad, lord of the storm, was riding. A stupor of despair went up to heaven when the god of the storm turned daylight to darkness, when he smashed the land like a cup. On the first day, the tempest blew swiftly and brought the flood. No man could see his fellow, nor could the people be distinguished from the sky. Even the gods were afraid of the flood. They withdrew. They went up to the heaven of Anu and crouched in the outskirts. The gods cowered like curs, while Ishtar cried, shrieking aloud, Have I given birth unto these mine own people? only to glut with their bodies the sea as though they were fish. Meanwhile, continued Utnapishtim, for six days and nights the wind blew. Torrent and tempest and flood overwhelmed the world. Tempest and flood raged together like warring hosts. When the seventh day dawned, the storm from the south subsided. The sea grew calm. The flood was stilled. I looked at the face of the world, and there was silence. The surface of the sea stretched as flat as a rooftop. All mankind had returned to clay. I opened a hatch, and light fell on my face. Then I bowed low. I sat down, and I wept. The tears streamed down my face, for on every side was the waste of water. Fourteen leagues distant, there appeared a mountain, and there the boat grounded. On the mountain of Nizir, the boat held fast. She held fast and did not budge. When the seventh day dawned, I loosed a dove and let her go. She flew away, but finding no resting place, she returned. Then I loosed a swallow, and she flew away, but finding no resting place, she returned. I loosed a raven. She saw that the waters had retreated. She ate, she flew around, she cawed, and she did not come back. Utnapishtim knew that it was now safe to disembark. I poured out a libation on the mountain top. I heaped up wood and cane and cedar and myrtle when the gods smelled the sweet savour. They gathered like flies over the sacrifice. These texts are not by any means the only ones to come down to us from the ancient land of Sumer. In other tablets, some almost 5,000 years old, others less than 3,000 years old, the Noah figure of Utnapishtim is known variously as Zisudra, Zisustros, or Atrahasis. Even so, he is always instantly recognizable as the same patriarchal character forewarned by the same merciful God who rides out the same universal flood in the same storm-tossed ark, and whose descendants repopulate the world. There are many obvious resemblances between the Mesopotamian flood myth and the famous biblical story of Noah and the deluge. Scholars argue endlessly about the nature of these resemblances. What really matters, however, is that in each sphere of influence the same solemn tradition has been preserved for posterity, a tradition which tells in graphic language of a global catastrophe and of the near-total annihilation of mankind. Central America The identical message 
was preserved in the Valley of Mexico, far away across the world from Mounts Ararat and Nisir. There, culturally and geographically isolated from Judeo-Christian influences, long ages before the arrival of the Spaniards, stories were told of a great deluge. As the listener will recall from part three, it was believed that this deluge had swept over the entire earth at the end of the fourth sun. Destruction came in the form of torrential rain and floods, the mountains disappeared, and men were transformed into fish. According to Aztec mythology, only two human beings survived, a man, Koshkoshli, and his wife, Joshi Quetzal, who had been forewarned of the cataclysm by a god. They escaped in a huge boat that they had been instructed to build and came to ground on the peak of a tall mountain. There they descended and afterwards had many children who were dumb until the time when a dove on top of a tree gave them the gift of languages. These languages differed so much that the children could not understand one another. A related Central American tradition, that of the Meco Akanasex, is in even more striking conformity with the story as we have it in Genesis and in the Mesopotamian sources. According to this tradition, the god Tezcatilpoca determined to destroy all mankind with a flood, saving only a certain Tezpi, who embarked in a spacious vessel with his wife, his children, and large numbers of animals and birds, as well as supplies of grains and seeds, the preservation of which were essential to the future subsistence of the human race. The vessel came to rest on an exposed mountain top, after Tezcatlipoca had decreed that the waters of the flood should retire. Wishing to find out whether it was now safe for him to disembark, Tezpi sent out a vulture, which feeding on the carcasses with which the earth was now strewn, did not return. The man then sent out other birds, of which only the hummingbird came back, with a leafy branch in its beak. With this sign that the land had begun to renew itself, Tezpi and his family went forth from their ark, multiplied, and repopulated the earth. Memories of a terrible flood resulting from divine displeasure are also preserved in the Popol Vuh. According to this archaic text, the great god decided to create humanity soon after the beginning of time. It was an experiment, and he began it with figures made of wood that looked like men and talked like men. These creatures fell out of favor because they did not remember their creator, and so a flood was brought about by the heart of heaven. A great flood was formed, which fell on the heads of the wooden creatures. A heavy resin fell from the sky, the face of the earth was darkened, and a black rain began to fall by day and by night. The wooden figures were annihilated, destroyed, broken up and killed. Not everyone perished, however. Like the Aztecs and the Mecoacanaseks, the Maya of the Yucatan and Guatemala believed that a Noah figure and his wife, the Great Father and the Great Mother, had survived the flood to populate the land anew, thus becoming the ancestors of all subsequent generations of humanity. South America. Moving to South America, we encounter the Chipcas of central Colombia. According to their myths, they had originally lived as savages, without laws, agriculture, or religion. Then one day there appeared among them an old man of a different race. He wore a thick, long beard, and his name was Bochica. He taught the Chipcas how to build huts and live together in society. His wife, who was very beautiful and named Chia, appeared after him, but she was wicked 
and enjoyed thwarting her husband's altruistic efforts. Since she could not overcome his power directly, she used magical means to cause a great flood in which the majority of the population died. Bochica was very angry and exiled Chia from the earth to the sky, where she became the moon given the task of lighting the nights. He also caused the waters of the flood to dissipate and brought down the few survivors from the mountains where they had taken refuge. Thereafter, he gave them laws, taught them to cultivate the land, and instituted the worship of the sun with periodic festivals, sacrifices, and pilgrimages. He then divided the power to govern among two chiefs, and spent the remainder of his days on earth living in quiet contemplation as an ascetic. When he ascended to heaven, he became a god. Farther south still, the Canarians, an Indian tribe of Ecuador, relate an ancient story of a flood from which two brothers escaped by going to the top of a high mountain. As the water rose, the mountain grew higher, so that the two brothers survived the disaster. When they were discovered, the Tupinamba Indians of Brazil venerated a series of civilizing or creator heroes. The first of these heroes was Monan, ancient, old, who was said to have been the creator of mankind, but who then destroyed the world with flood and fire. Peru, as we heard in part two, is particularly rich in flood legends. A typical story tells of an Indian who was warned by a llama of a deluge. Together, the man and the llama fled to a high mountain called Vilcacoto. When they reached the top of the mountain, they saw that all kinds of birds and animals had already taken refuge there. The sea began to rise and covered all the plains and mountains except the top of Vilcacoto. And even there the waves dashed up so high that the animals were forced to crowd into a narrow area. Five days later the water ebbed and the sea returned to its bed. But all human beings except one were drowned, and from him are descended all the nations on earth. The Araucanians of pre-Columbian Chile preserved a tradition that there was once a flood which very few Indians escaped. The survivors took refuge on a high mountain called Theg Theg, the thundering or the glittering, which had three peaks and the ability to float on water. In the far south of the continent, a Yamana legend from Tierra del Fuego states, the moon woman caused the flood. This was at the time of the great upheaval. Moon was filled with hatred towards human beings. At that time, everybody drowned with the exception of those few who were able to escape to the five mountain peaks that the water did not cover another tierra del fuego tribe the pehuenche associate the flood with a prolonged period of darkness the sun and the moon fell from the sky and the world stayed that way without light until finally Two giant condors carried both the sun and the moon back up to the sky. North America Meanwhile, at the other end of the Americas, among the Inuit of Alaska, there existed a tradition of a terrible flood, accompanied by an earthquake, which swept so rapidly over the face of the earth that only a few people managed to escape in their canoes or take refuge on the tops of the highest mountains, petrified with terror. The Luiseno of Lower California had a legend that a flood covered the mountains and destroyed most of mankind. Only a few were saved because they fled to the highest peaks, which were spared when all the rest of the world was inundated. The survivors remained there until the flood ended. Farther north, 
Similar flood myths were recorded amongst the Hurons, and a legend of the Montagne, belonging to the Algonquin family, related how Michabo, or the Great Hare, re-established the world after the flood with the help of a raven, an otter, and a muskrat. Lynn's History of the Dakotas, an authoritative work of the 19th century, which preserved many indigenous traditions that would otherwise have been lost, reports an Iroquois myth that the sea and waters had at one time infringed upon the land so that all human life was destroyed. The Chickasaws asserted that the world had been destroyed by water, but that one family was saved, and two animals of every kind. The Sioux also spoke of a time when there was no dry land, and when all men disappeared from existence. Water, water, everywhere. How far, and how widely, across the myth-memories of mankind, do the ripples of the great flood spread? Very widely, indeed. More than 500 deluge legends are known around the world, and in a survey of 86 of these, 20 Asiatic, 3 European, 7 African, 46 American, and 10 from Australia and the Pacific, the specialist researcher Dr. Richard Andre concluded that 62 were entirely independent of the Mesopotamian and Hebrew accounts. For example, Early Jesuit scholars, who were among the first Europeans to visit China, had the opportunity in the Imperial Library to study a vast work consisting of 4,320 volumes said to have been handed down from ancient times and to contain all knowledge. This great book included a number of traditions which told of the consequences that followed when mankind rebelled against the high gods and the system of the universe fell into disorder. The planets altered their courses, the sky sank lower towards the north, the sun, moon and stars changed their motions, the earth fell to pieces, and the waters in its bosom rushed upwards with violence and overflowed the earth. In the Malaysian tropical forest, the Chewong people believe that every so often their own world, which they call Earth-7, turns upside down so that everything is flooded and destroyed. However, through the agency of the creator god Tohan, the flat new surface of what had previously been the underside of Earth-7 is molded into mountains, valleys, and plains. New trees are planted, and new humans born. A flood myth of Laos and northern Thailand has it that beings called the Thens lived in the upper kingdom long ages ago, while the masters of the lower world were three great men. Pu Leng Sweng, Kun Khan, and Kun Ket. One day the Thens announced that before eating any meal, people should give them a part of their food as a sign of respect. The people refused, and in a rage, the Thens created a flood which devastated the whole earth. The three great men built a raft on top of which they made a small house, and embarked with a number of women and children. In this way, they and their descendants survived the deluge. In similar fashion, the Karens of Burma have traditions of a global deluge from which two brothers were saved on a raft. Such a deluge is also part of the mythology of Vietnam, where a brother and sister are said to have survived in a great wooden chest, which also contained two of every kind of animal. Several Aboriginal Australian peoples, especially those whose traditional homelands are along the tropical northern coast, ascribe their origins to a great flood, which swept away the previous landscape and society. 
Meanwhile, in the origin myths of a number of other tribes, the cosmic serpent Yulungur, associated with the rainbow, is held responsible for the deluge. There are Japanese traditions, according to which the Pacific islands of Oceania were formed after the waters of a great deluge had receded. In Oceania itself, a myth of the native inhabitants of Hawaii tells how the world was destroyed by a flood and later recreated by a god named Tangaloa. The Samoans believe that there was once an inundation that wiped out almost all mankind. It was survived only by two human beings who put to sea in a boat which eventually came to rest in the Samoan archipelago. Greece, India and Egypt on the other side of the world, Greek mythology too is haunted by memories of a deluge. Here, however, as in Central America, the inundation is not viewed as an isolated event, but as one of a series of destructions and remakings of the world. The Aztecs and the Maya spoke in terms of successive suns or epochs, of which our own was thought to be the fifth and last. In similar fashion, the oral traditions of ancient Greece, collected and set down in writing by Hesiod in the 8th century BC, related that prior to the present creation, there had been four earlier races of men on earth. Each of these was thought more advanced than the one that followed it, and each at the appointed hour had been swallowed up in a geological cataclysm. The first and most ancient creation had been mankind's golden race, who had lived like the gods, free from care, without trouble or woe. With ageless limbs they reveled at their banquets. When they died, it was as men overcome by sleep. With the passing of time, and at the command of Zeus, this golden race eventually sank into the depths of the earth. It was succeeded by the silver race, which was supplanted by the bronze race, which was replaced by the race of heroes, which was followed by the iron race, our own, the fifth and most recent creation. It is the fate of the bronze race that is of particular interest to us here. Described in the myths as having the strength of giants and mighty hands on their mighty limbs, these formidable men were exterminated by Zeus, king of the gods, as a punishment for the misdeeds of Prometheus, the rebellious titan who had presented humanity with the gift of fire. The mechanism the vengeful deity used to sweep the earth clean was an overwhelming flood. In the most widespread version of the story, Prometheus impregnated a human female. She bore him a son named Deucalion, who ruled over the country of Phythia in Thessaly, and took to wife Pyrrha, the red blonde, daughter of Epimetheus and Pandora. When Zeus reached his fateful decision to destroy the bronze race, Deucalion, forewarned by Prometheus, made a wooden box, stored in it all that was necessary, and climbed into it with Pyrrha. The king of the gods caused mighty rains to pour from heaven, flooding the greater part of the earth. All mankind perished in this deluge, save a few who had fled to the highest mountains. It also happened at this time that the mountains of Thessaly were split asunder, and the whole country as far as the Isthmus and the Peloponnese became a single sheet of water. Deucalion and Pyrrha floated over this sea in their box for nine days and nights, finally landing on Mount Parnassus. There, after the rains had ceased, they disembarked and sacrificed to the gods. In response, Zeus sent Hermes to Deucalion with permission to ask for whatever he wished. He wished 
for human beings. Zeus then bade him take stones and throw them over his shoulder. The stones Deucalion threw became men, and those that Pyrrha threw became women. As the Hebrews looked back on Noah, so the Greeks of ancient historical times looked back upon Deucalion as the ancestor of their nation and as the founder of numerous towns and temples. A similar figure was revered in Vedic India more than 3,000 years ago. One day, the story goes, when a certain wise man named Manu was making his ablutions, he found in the hollow of his hand a tiny little fish which begged him to allow it to live. Taking pity on it, he put it in a jar. The next day, however, it had grown so much bigger that he had to carry it to a lake. Soon the lake was too small. Throw me into the sea, said the fish, which was in reality a manifestation of the god Vishnu, and I shall be more comfortable. Then he warned Manu of a coming deluge. He sent him a large ship with orders to load it with two of every living species and the seeds of every plant, and then to go on board himself. Manu had only just carried out these orders when the ocean rose and submerged everything, and nothing was to be seen but Vishnu in his fish form, now a huge, one-horned creature with golden scales. Manu moored his ark to the horn of the fish, and Vishnu towed it across the brimming waters until it came to rest on the exposed peak of the mountain of the north. The fish said, I have saved thee. Fasten the vessel to a tree, that the water may not sweep it away while thou art on the mountain, and in proportion as the waters decrease thou shalt descend. Manu descended with the waters. The deluge had carried away all creatures, and Manu remained alone. With him, and with the animals and plants he had saved from destruction, began a new age of the world. After a year, there emerged from the waters a woman who announced herself as the daughter of Manu. The couple married and produced children, thus becoming the ancestors of the present race of mankind. Last but by no means least, ancient Egyptian traditions also refer to a great flood. A funerary text, discovered in the tomb of Pharaoh Seti I, for example, tells of the destruction of sinful humanity by a deluge. The reasons for this catastrophe are set out in chapter 175 of the Book of the Dead, which attributes the following speech to the moon god Thoth. They have fought fights, they have upheld strife, they have done evil, they have created hostilities, they have made slaughter, they have caused trouble and oppression. Therefore, I am going to blot out everything which I have made. This earth shall enter into the watery abyss by means of a raging flood, and will become even as it was in primeval time. On the trail of a mystery. With the words of Thoth, we have come full circle to the Sumerian and biblical floods. The earth was filled with violence, says Genesis, and God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Like the flood of Deucalion, the flood of Manu, and the flood that destroyed the Aztec's fourth son, the biblical deluge was the end of a world age. A new age succeeded it, our own, populated by the descendants of Noah. From the very beginning, however, it was understood that this age, too, 
would in due course come to a catastrophic end. As the old song puts it, God gave Noah the rainbow sign, no more water, the fire next time. The scriptural source for this prophecy of world destruction is to be found in 2 Peter 3. We must be careful to remember that during the last days there are bound to be people who will be scornful and who will say, everything goes on as it has since it began at the creation. They are choosing to forget that there were heavens at the beginning and that the earth was formed by the word of God out of water and between the waters, so that the world of that time was destroyed by being flooded by water. But by the same word, the present sky and earth are destined for fire, and are only being reserved until judgment day, so that all sinners may be destroyed. The day of the Lord will come, as a thief in the night, and then with a roar the sky will vanish, the elements will catch fire and fall apart, and the earth, and all that it contains, will be burnt up. The Bible, therefore, envisages two ages of the world, our own being the second and last. Elsewhere, in other cultures, different numbers of creations and destructions are recorded, in China, for instance, the perished ages are called Kis, ten of which are said to have elapsed from the beginning of time until Confucius. At the end of each Kis, in a general convulsion of nature, the sea is carried out of its bed, mountains spring up out of the ground, rivers change their course, human beings and everything are ruined, and the ancient trace is effaced. Buddhist scriptures speak of seven suns, each brought to an end by water, fire, or wind. At the end of the seventh sun, the current world cycle, it is expected that the earth will break into flames. Aboriginal traditions of Sarawak and Saba recall that the sky was once low, and tell us that six suns perished, at present, the world is illuminated by the seventh sun. Similarly, the Sibylline books speak of nine suns that are nine ages, and prophesy two ages yet to come, those of the eighth and the ninth sun. On the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, the Hopi Indians of Arizona, who are distant relatives of the Aztecs, recorded three previous suns, each culminating in a great annihilation, followed by the gradual re-emergence of mankind. In Aztec cosmology, of course, there were four suns prior to our own. Such minor differences concerning the precise number of destructions and creations envisaged in this or that mythology should not distract us from the remarkable convergence of ancient traditions evident here. All over the world, these traditions appear to commemorate a widespread series of catastrophes. In many cases, the character of each successive cataclysm is obscured by the use of poetic language and the piling up of metaphor and symbols. Quite frequently also, at least two different kinds of disaster may be portrayed as having occurred simultaneously, most frequently floods and earthquakes, but sometimes fire and a terrifying darkness. All this contributes to the creation of a confused and jumbled picture. The myths of the Hopi, however, stand out for their straightforwardness and simplicity. What they tell us is this. The first world was destroyed as a punishment for human misdemeanors by an all-consuming fire that came from above and below. 
The second world ended when the terrestrial globe toppled from its axis and everything was covered with ice. The third world ended in a universal flood. The present world is the fourth. Its fate will depend on whether or not its inhabitants behave in accordance with the Creator's plans. We are on the trail of a mystery here, and while we may never hope to fathom the plans of the Creator, we should be able to reach a judgment concerning the riddle of our converging myths of global destruction. Through these myths, the voices of the ancients speak to us directly. What are they trying to say? The Many Masks of the Apocalypse Like the Hopi Indians of North America, the Avestic Aryans of pre-Islamic Iran believed that there were three epochs of creation prior to our own. In the first epoch, Men were pure and sinless, tall and long-lived, but at its close the evil one declared war against Ahura Mazda, the holy god, and a tumultuous cataclysm ensued. During the second epoch, the evil one was unsuccessful. In the third, good and evil were exactly balanced. In the fourth epoch, the present age of the world, Evil triumphed at the outset, and has maintained its supremacy ever since. The end of the fourth epoch is predicted soon. But it is the cataclysm at the end of the first epoch that interests us here. It is not a flood, and yet it converges in so many ways with many global flood traditions that some connection is strongly suggested. The Avestic scriptures take us back to a time of paradise on earth, when the remote ancestors of the ancient Iranian people lived in the fabled Ariana Vallejo, the first good and happy creation of Ahura Mazda, that flourished in the first age of the world, the mythical birthplace and original home of the Aryan race. In those days, Ariana Vallejo enjoyed a mild and productive climate, with seven months of summer and five of winter. Rich in wildlife and in crops, its meadows flowing with streams, this garden of delights was converted into an uninhabitable wasteland of ten months winter and only two months summer as a result of the onslaught of Angra Mainyu, the evil one. The first of the good lands and countries which I, Ahura Mazda, created was Ariana Vallejo. Then Angra Mainyu, who is full of death, created an opposition to the same, a mighty serpent and snow. Ten months of winter are there now, two months of summer, and these are cold as to the water cold as to the earth, cold as to the trees, there all around falls deep snow. That is the direst of plagues. The listener will agree that a sudden and drastic change in the climate of Ariana Vallejo is indicated. The Avestic scriptures leave us in no doubt about this. Earlier, they describe a meeting of the celestial gods called by Ahura Mazda and tell us that the fair Yima, the good shepherd of high renown in the Ariana Vallejo, attended this meeting with all his excellent mortals. It is at this point that the strange parallels with the traditions of the biblical flood begin to crop up. For Ahura Mazda takes advantage of the meeting to warn Yima of what is about to happen as a result of the powers of the evil one. And Ahura Mazda spake unto Yima, saying, Yima the fair, upon the material world a fatal winter is about to descend that shall bring a vehement destroying frost. Upon the corporeal world will the evil of winter come. 
wherefore snow will fall in great abundance. And all three sorts of beasts shall perish, those that live in the wilderness, and those that live on the tops of the mountains, and those that live in the depths of the valleys, under the shelter of stables. Therefore make thee a var, a hypogeum, or underground enclosure, the length of a riding ground to all four corners. Thither bring thou the representatives of every kind of beast, great and small, of the cattle, of the beasts of burden, and of men, of dogs, of birds, and of the red burning fires. There shalt thou make water flow. Thou shalt put birds in the trees along the water's edge in verdure which is everlasting. There put specimens of all plants, the loveliest and most fragrant, and of all fruits the most succulent. All these kinds of things and creatures shall not perish so long as they are in the var. But put there no deformed creature, nor impotent, nor mad, neither wicked, nor deceitful, nor rancorous, nor jealous, nor a man with irregular teeth, nor a leper. Apart from the scale of the enterprise, there is only one real difference between Yima's divinely inspired var and Noah's divinely inspired ark. The ark is a means of surviving a terrible and devastating flood, which will destroy every living creature by drowning the world in water. The var is a means of surviving a terrible and devastating winter, which will destroy every living creature by covering the earth with a freezing blanket of ice and snow. In the Bundahish, another of the Zoroastrian scriptures, believed to incorporate ancient material from a lost part of the original Avesta, more information is provided on the cataclysm of glaciation that overwhelmed Ariana Vallejo. When Angra Mainyu sent the vehement destroying frost, he also assaulted and deranged the sky. The Bundahish tells us that this assault enabled the evil one to master one-third of the sky and overspread it with darkness as the encroaching ice sheets tightened their grip. Indescribable cold, fire, earthquakes, and derangement of the skies. The Avestic Aryans of Iran who are known to have migrated to Western Asia from some other distant homeland, are not the only possessors of archaic traditions which echo the basic setting of the Great Flood in ways unlikely to be coincidental. Indeed, though these are most commonly associated with the deluge, the familiar themes of the divine warning and of the salvation of a remnant of mankind from a universal disaster are also found in many different parts of the world in connection with the sudden onset of glacial conditions. In South America, for example, Toba Indians of the Gran Chaco region that sprawls across the modern borders of Paraguay, Argentina and Chile still repeat an ancient myth concerning the advent of what they call the Great Cold. For warning comes from a semi-divine hero figure named Asin. Asin told a man to gather as much wood as he could and to cover his hut with a thick layer of thatch because a time of great cold was coming. As soon as the hut had been prepared, Asin and the man shut themselves inside and waited. When the great cold set in, shivering people arrived to beg a firebrand from them. Asin was hard and gave embers only to those who had been his friends. The people were freezing, and they cried the whole night. At midnight they were all dead, young and old, men and women. This period of ice and sleet lasted for a long time, 
and all the fires were put out. Frost was as thick as leather. As in the Avestic traditions, it seems that the great cold was accompanied by great darkness. In the words of one Toba elder, these afflictions were sent because when the earth is full of people, it has to change. The population has to be thinned out to save the world. In the case of the long darkness, the sun simply disappeared and the people starved. As they ran out of food, they began eating their children. Eventually, they all died. The Mayan Popol Vu associates the flood with much hail, black rain and mist, and indescribable cold. It also says that this was a period when it was cloudy and twilight all over the world. The faces of the sun and the moon were covered. Other Maya sources confirm that these strange and terrible phenomena were experienced by mankind in the time of the ancients. The earth darkened. It happened that the sun was still bright and clear. Then at midday it got dark. Sunlight did not return till the twenty-sixth year after the flood. The listener may recall that many deluge and catastrophe myths contain references not only to the onset of a great darkness, but to other changes in the appearance of the heavens. In Tierra del Fuego, for instance, it was said that the sun and the moon fell from the sky, and in China that the planets altered their courses, the sun, moon, and stars changed their motions. The Incas believed that in ancient times the Andes were split apart when the sky made war on the earth. The Tarahumara of northern Mexico have preserved world destruction legends based on a change in the sun's path. An African myth from the lower Congo states that long ago the sun met the moon and threw mud at it, which made it less bright. When this meeting happened, there was a great flood. The Kato Indians of California say simply that the sky fell. And ancient Greek or Roman myths tell that the flood of Deucalion was immediately preceded by awesome celestial events. These events are graphically symbolized in the story of how Phaethon, child of the sun, harnessed his father's chariot, but was unable to guide it along his father's course. Soon the fiery horses felt how their reins were in an unpractised hand. Rearing and swerving aside, they left their wonted way. Then all the earth was amazed to see that the glorious sun, instead of holding his stately, beneficent course across the sky, seemed to speed crookedly overhead and to rush down in wrath like a meteor. This is not the place to speculate on what may have caused the alarming disturbances in the patterns of the heavens that are linked with cataclysm legends from all over the world. For our purposes at present, it's sufficient to note that such traditions seem to refer to the same derangement of the sky that accompanied the fatal winter and spreading ice sheets described in the Iranian Avesta. Other linkages occur. Fire, for example, often follows or precedes the flood. In the case of Phaethon's adventure with the sun, the grass withered, the crops were scorched, the woods went up in fire and smoke, then beneath them the bare earth cracked and crumbled and the blackened rocks burst asunder under the heat. Volcanism and earthquakes are also mentioned frequently in association with the flood, particularly in the Americas. 
The Araucanians of Chile say quite explicitly that the flood was the result of volcanic eruptions accompanied by violent earthquakes. The Mam Maya of Santiago Chimaltenango in the western highlands of Guatemala retain memories of a flood of burning pitch which they say was one of the instruments of world destruction, and in the Gran Chaco of Argentina, the Mataco Indians tell of a black cloud that came from the south at the time of the flood and covered the whole sky. Lightning struck and thunder was heard, yet the drops that fell were not like rain, they were like fire. A monster chased the sun. There is one ancient culture that perhaps preserves more vivid memories in its myths than any others, that of the so-called Teutonic tribes of Germany and Scandinavia, a culture best remembered through the songs of the Norse scalds and sages. The stories those songs retell have their roots in a past which may be much older than scholars imagine and which combine familiar images with strange symbolic devices and allegorical language to recall a cataclysm of awesome magnitude. In a distant forest, in the east, an aged giantess brought into the world a whole brood of young wolves, whose father was Fenrir. One of these monsters chased the sun to take possession of it. The chase was for long in vain, but each season the wolf grew in strength, and at last he reached the sun. Its bright rays were one by one extinguished. It took on a blood-red hue, then entirely disappeared. Thereafter, the world was enveloped in hideous winter. Snowstorms descended from all points of the horizon. War broke out all over the earth. Brother slew brother. Children no longer respected the ties of blood. It was a time when men were no better than wolves, eager to destroy one another. Soon the world was going to sink into the abyss of nothingness. Meanwhile, the wolf Fenrir, whom the gods had long ago so carefully chained up, broke his bonds at last and escaped. He shook himself, and the world trembled. The ash tree Yggdrasil, envisaged as the axis of the earth, was shaken from its roots to its topmost branches. Mountains crumbled or split from top to bottom, and the dwarves who had their subterranean dwellings in them sought desperately and in vain for entrances so long familiar but now disappeared. Abandoned by the gods, men were driven from their hearths, and the human race was swept from the surface of the earth. The earth itself was beginning to lose its shape. Already the stars were coming adrift from the sky and falling into the gaping void. They were like swallows, weary from too long a voyage, who drop and sink into the waves. The giant soot set the entire earth on fire. The universe was no longer more than an immense furnace. Flames spurted from fissures in the rocks. Everywhere there was the hissing of steam. All living things, all plant life were blotted out. Only the naked soil remained. But like the sky itself, the earth was no more than cracks and crevices. And now all the rivers, all the seas, rose and overflowed. From every side, waves lashed against waves. They swelled and boiled slowly over all things. The earth sank beneath the sea. Yet 
Not all men perished in the great catastrophe. Enclosed in the wood itself of the ash tree Yggdrasil, which the devouring flames of the universal conflagration had been unable to consume, the ancestors of a future race of men had escaped death. In this asylum they had found their only nourishment had been the morning dew. Thus it was that from the wreckage of the ancient world a new world was born. Slowly the earth emerged from the waves, mountains rose again, and from them streamed cataracts of singing waters. The new world this Teutonic myth announces is our own. Needless to say, like the fifth son of the Aztecs and the Maya, it was created long ago, and is new no longer. Can it be a coincidence that one of the many Central American flood myths about the fourth epoch, for Atl, water, does not install the Noah couple in an ark, but places them instead in a great tree, just like Yggdrasil? For Atl was ended by floods, the mountains disappeared. Two persons survived because they were ordered by one of the gods to bore a hole in the trunk of a very large tree and to crawl inside when the skies fell. The pair entered and survived. Their offspring repopulated the world. Isn't it odd? that the same symbolic language keeps cropping up in ancient traditions from so many widely scattered regions of the world. How can this be explained? Are we talking about some vast subconscious wave of intercultural telepathy? Or could elements of these remarkable universal myths have been engineered long ages ago by clever and purposeful people. Which of these improbable propositions is the more likely to be true? Or are there other possible explanations for the enigma of the myths? We shall return to these questions in due course. Meanwhile, what are we to conclude about the apocalyptic visions of fire and ice, flood, volcanism and earthquakes, which the myths contain? They have about them a haunting and familiar realism. Could this be because they speak to us of a past we suspect to be our own, but can neither remember clearly nor forget completely?